Hi everyone, this is Mind Rolling. I'm Raghu, and I got a very special podcast that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. About? You can tell where I'm from. Uh, but first, I want to say something about our wonderful partner, 1440 the Multiversity. You go to 1440.org, this beautiful contemplative campus. Gee, I wonder if they use that term. It's pretty good. And it is beautiful, and it is contemplative. They have extraordinary weekend workshops with an array of just uh, absolutely, they're luminaries, that's all I can say. And I want to tell you about a couple of them. Uh, Start with Gabor Mate, who is one of the, he's part of my Canadian family, and Gabor is one of the leading experts, psychiatrist, and uh, but experts in addiction and so on. And I did a wonderful podcast with Gabor, oh, probably a year and a half ago. Uh, but we'll put that up in the show notes as something else to link to because it was really fabulous. But Gabor is going to be doing uh, a weekend workshop on compassionate inquiry. Uh, which piqued me enough to go, wow, let's do a podcast on that, Gabor. So I'm going to call him about that. And he's going to be in dialogue with Adi Ashanti. So go to 1440.org, plug in Gabor Mate. I think it's in March of 2019. And then there's uh, somebody I do not know. I also want to think that, uh, or want to get with and think that uh, what she has to offer is something that would be worthwhile for us all here on Mind Rolling. And uh, the little blurb said, "No human. It's, her name is Martha Beck. No human being on this planet has changed my life more than Martha. And that's Elizabeth uh, Gilbert, who wrote that very popular uh, spiritual book years ago. Hugely popular. So we'll take Elizabeth on her word, and uh, I'm going to get in touch with Martha as well. So look her up there on 1440.org. And then there's Will Kabat-Zinn. And Will, part of who he is, he's a, I know of him as a meditation teacher. And here I'm going to be dumber than dumb, but he must be the son of John Kabat-Zinn. Could there be <laughs> a bunch of Kabat-Zinns around that are doing this stuff? And uh, he's a, uh, a Dharma ally, and uh, another person that I'd love to talk to. So 1440.org, just a, a, f- a wonderful place to do a retreat and get real information about how and you know how to get to the motto of mind rolling, living, how to live an, a balanced life, life in balance. Okay, so that's uh, uh, a little bit of a, informational on 1440. Uh, This podcast coming up basically is a a, um, a session that I did at a, moderated at a, a convention or a convening in downtown Los Angeles not too long ago called The Summit. And basically it's a get together of very well known people who are coming up with ideas that can help change our planet and, and, and improve. And boy, do we need some help these days, don't we? Uh, the head, uh, head, the lead uh, speaker was Al Gore. And, you know, it was people like Howard Schultz were there and Ariana Huffington and people like that who have a, a lot to add to try and, and um, counter and improve on some of what's, that's a wild understatement, right, everybody? Uh, what's going on in this world right now, in this country. But uh, we were there uh, to uh, add our little bit of um, advice, isn't the right word, but we got together, me and Duncan Trussell and uh, Trudy and Jack, Cornfield, Trudy Goodman and Jack Cornfield. And then Ramdas was uh, zoomed in at the end. 
and he uh, was asked a couple of questions. Uh, that one of them was, "What do we do with this anxiety that's going on day to day? How do we deal with it? What what should we do, Ramdas?" First thing he said, "Turn off your television." <laughs> There's a great start, right? Uh, and then he went into uh, some real practical stuff about about what it is that we can do. And uh, Duncan and I, uh, we pursued this major theme that we've been pursuing and I've been pursuing for quite some time around Krishna Das's, and hopefully many of you, of course, know Krishna Das, and his new affer. Well, it's not new, he's been doing this for years. We wake up in the morning and start the movie of me. So we, on the this panel, we talked a lot about our attachment to our stories and what that, how that really takes place in every single one of us and dictates our lives in a way that is not very conducive to staying present. Uh, so we had a fantastic conversation. Uh, Duncan had a, a wonderful story, actually, around his father's death that uh, I think you'll appreciate in terms of of uh, having awareness about being able to transform ourselves and not kill ourselves because we day-to-day are caught in this story. So no doubt about that. So here it is. And it's our summit, conference at the summit. I was thinking like something like that. This is basically Love, Serve, Remember goes to the summit with, again, Trudy Goodman, Jack Cornfield, Duncan Trussell, myself, and then, of course, our major uh, guest star, Ram Das. So I hope you enjoy this on Mind Rolling. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you get, of course, a plethora of wonderful podcasters, including our newest edition, Omid Safi, who does fantastic uh, podcasts around, basically around Sufi practice and Sufi lifestyle and just plain old what he calls radical love. Uh, So check it out, and we will see you next time here on Mind Rolling. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. Thank you, Summit, for having us. And the rest of our family here, Jack Cornfield and his wife, Trudy Goodman. Her husband, Jack Cornfield, right. Let's get it. And... uh, so we spend a lot of time together, the four of us, in retreats in Maui with Ramdas. And uh, one of the things we do there is kind of a bit of what we're going to do here format wise. Duncan Trussell is my podcast guru. He's the one who turned me on to doing podcasts to create the Be Here Now Network. And we've done so much work uh, on podcasts uh, with the likes of. Uh, many, many different people who have uh, share consciousness with us. And in Maui, we do a podcast uh, a couple of hours, one of the days, and we invite Jack and Trudy and other people to join us. So this is kind of, it's so a little bit of a loose, chatty kind of thing, extemporaneous, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we have scripted it out, actually. We <laughs> spent a lot of time memorizing what we're about to say, but... It's going to seem like we don't know what we're about to say. Yeah. So uh, now uh, this this uh, theme that we've thought of is something that's been happening uh, that we've been talking a lot about in in Maui at these retreats with Ramdas, and uh, it the first thing that happened was Duncan asked a. a good friend of ours, part of our family, Sharon Salzberg, who, with Jack, was one of uh, uh, the two of the three people who brought back Vipassana meditation to this country. And Sharon, you tell him. What did you say to Sharon? Uh, what, what I said, there was a period when I was, I was just trying to figure out a way to incorporate 
whiskey into a meditation practice. So I was watching Westworld and, and I somehow, you know, my alcohol habituation was telling me that it'd be cool to drink whiskey while watching Westworld because they drink whiskey in Westworld. And then whatever ridiculous spiritual part of me there was, was trying to actually turn that into some kind of holy activity. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, oh, if I drink this whiskey mindfully, there must be some practice here. So uh, I asked Sharon Salzberg, you know, is this a practice? And she said, well, it's a practice, but you're practicing the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you said, well, okay, well, what do you do? for practice. And that started a whole avalanche of thoughts that we have been discussing for all that time. She said, I sit down, I get up in the morning, I sit down, I get real. So we were, okay, how do we do that? Right? That was our next step. And then Duncan and I have been talking about the uh, that realness and and the kinds of things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis that are absolutely completely uh, self-referential and then we heard our friend Krishna Das who's also part of this whole gang that we uh, uh, that takes place uh, uh, the teachings that take place in Maui who said who often says wake up in the morning and we are the star producer and director of the movie of me and so we've been been investigating this movie of me and how we are all so absolutely uh, the Buddhists call it self-cherishing and I love that term and we wanted to give a couple of examples of of how it is. Now, Duncan only has a couple, but there's one good one. So, will you share that with us? Yeah, I only have two examples of self-cherishing. Um, <laughs> I'm shocked, Duncan. I'm what shocked. What did you say you when know. I told you that, Jack? When I said I only have two examples of self-cherishing, what did you say? You, you said your family and what was the other one? Yeah, and your life. <laughs> yeah, your family and your life. Well, you know, I'm, I don't... My tendency, unfortunately, well, or fortunately, because I have a podcast, is to talk too much. And we're up here with um, uh, people who have a lifetime of practice. So I'm going to try to say this very quickly. And then Ramdas is coming. I don't want to eat up a lot of the greenery, as they say. But my father passed away recently. And um, I've been going to these retreats for uh, some time. And it did... It, it started off with some kind of seriousness, I guess, but there was a sort of an, a frivolity to it, I think is a word for it, or a kind of feeling of like, this is cool. It is cool. I mean, you could tell people, I go to these retreats, and you seem kind of cool. Um, and there's something in it that's kind of fashionable, too. And, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, they also do teach you these wonderful things, you know. And so my father is passing away in front of me. He's dying. And... Um, uh, one of the things that I've been taught by these wonderful people up here is, you know, uh, love everyone and tell the truth. And when you get around dying people, you know, your tendency is to lie your ass off. And my dad thought that was funny. He was telling me, everybody keeps telling me I look great. What are they talking about? I look terrible. And I was able to look at him and say, well, that's because you're dying, dad. <laughs> And the relief in his face, you know. Like when you, or suddenly there's someone who's telling the truth to, it, to you and everyone's been lying. Ramdas talks about this. I was able to sit in my father's deathbed and he would come out of his delirium and he would say, what's happening? And I would say, you're dying, you know. And there was a sense of some ground there. At least there's some truth, you know. But in the midst of this, I started, it, I started like freaking out. And so I texted um, Raghu here. And this is where they say we take shelter in the Buddha. We take shelter in the Dharma. We take shelter in the song of the spiritual community. I used to hear that stuff and be like, they don't mean all three of those probably. It's just something they say. But they're all very important. And so I texted my friend here. And I said, I just don't want my dad to suffer. 
And he wrote back, take yourself out of it. Because he knew what I was really doing was, I don't want to feel the suffering that comes from watching my dad suffer. And it was so precise and so the right thing to say at that moment. Because at that moment, I was able to become part of the now and to really be with my father, really be with him in that moment of, of his passing. He was gone in, I think, probably uh, eight hours or so after that. And it was so important. It was so, so important. I don't mean to get all heavy and like fire. We must, do, but there is a good reason for this. And I'll end on this. Bob Thurman, this great Buddhist teacher, when he kicked off the Ram Dass retreat, he said, practice, practice, practice. Everybody's always talking about practice. I'd like to see someone perform for once. <laughs> and I think that's where we're at now, you know, in every single moment. But certainly, this thing that I'm sure all of you are doing, at some point, you'll find out that it's good to take... If the earth was dying in the way my father was dying, then we have to figure out a way to take ourselves out of it if we're to do anything that makes any sense at all. And uh, this is why I think we're very lucky to have uh, people like this around. And um, that, that's it for me. Bye. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> that is a little bit of what we're talking, though, taking ourselves out of this. Stop putting ourselves first in every possible situation. And um, Jack, I want to talk a little bit the, the, it's very difficult because of the gigantic habitual patterns we've created or have been created in our lives, right? The um, proclivities to doing things that are the easiest way out and, and we just constantly creating karma and so on and so forth. Um, I'd like to invite my beloved Trudy to speak to that first if she's willing. I think that's me. You know, this movement from me to we, it's really, I'll tell you the story of when I first learned to meditate. And I've been meditating for probably about 45 years now. I met Jack at the second retreat he ever taught. We were in our 20s. And unfortunately, we didn't marry each other then, but We've made up for that since. And our whole meditation instruction from my first teacher, who was a Korean Zen master named Sansanim, the whole instruction was just to look at who am I? Who is this I, me, myself that I'm so obsessed with that I look at all of life through, is this good for me? Is this bad for me? Is this going to bring me pleasure? Is this going to, you know... It's like looking at the sky through a straw. And so he taught us to look at who we are by asking a question. And this was our meditation instruction. And he showed us like this. Um, you have to pretend I'm sitting cross-legged because I have these big boots. It's sort of awkward. But so the question was, you'd be sitting cross-legged. You sit in your meditation posture, whatever it is. We would hold our hands in this mudra like that. Zen mudra, and then to say, what am I? I know, it's funny. But not who am I, what am I? What is this? What is, what is this that we are? And then he would give us the answer. And the answer to this inquiry, oh, but first he told us how. This is how you inquire. You just ask, you just look, you turn, you know, the eyes or our awareness is always going out our eyes toward looking out at each other and everything. You just take a step back and look this way. Look at the self. Look at the eye. And look like, what am I? Who am I? 
And he says, like looking for your wallet. If you're looking for your wallet, you misplace your keys or something, you don't go from room to room. Where's my wallet? Where's my wallet? Where's my wallet? You, you just look for it. And that was the instruction. Just look for what this I is. And then he gave us the answer. Again, in our meditation posture, what am I? And he would say, don't know. <laughs> and that became a thing. You may have even heard of don't know mind. It's become an expression in our world. But what he was doing was trying to show us how to be with what we don't know, how to be with the mystery of life and death, the mystery of our being, how to be able to tolerate that unknown, that uncertainty, and, and really out of that effort and that willingness to do that, to just sit in the not knowing. And of course, everything we do know is coming up all the time, but we're coming back to that sense of that which is beyond what we can know, and that's really who we are. It's so much bigger than what we think and who we think we are. And that's good news, because who we think we are is often limited and not even that great. And when we can open out into this deeper, vaster, bigger sense of we, of all of us, of everything, of connecting to all life and our kinship with all life, you know, then the qualities that I know Raghu wants us to talk about, like generosity and love, they just arise spontaneously in our hearts. We don't have to make them happen. And the reason they arise, arise spontaneously is why? Because it's who we most truly are. We are, and you can see this with babies, with toddlers, they care if someone else cries. We're caring beings. It's innate. It's wired into us. And I guess um, one of the most inspiring examples of this that I've seen recently, and I was supposed to go back there uh, in a week, but they changed the dates and I couldn't go, was in the Darfuri refugee camp, Gozamir, that I visited to teach mindfulness almost two years ago now. And it's on the border... Um, of South Sudan, of Darfur, it's in Eastern Chad. There's a string of camps. There's about 300,000 refugees who've been living in these camps for 15 years. I mean, imagine going camping and never being able to go home. And that's their life. They're like open prisons. And in the camps, we were teaching mindfulness and you think, where's mindfulness on the hierarchy of needs when people are hungry and frightened and actually in significant danger still. But they loved mindfulness. People loved learning to meditate on just being here now. They could disengage from their flashbacks of trauma and get grounded in the present moment and appreciate life in a new way. But what I learned there is the generosity and the resilience of people living in such tough, really terrible conditions. And even the little children. Uh, I was working with the teachers of a preschool program, and the children would get one meal. It was probably their only meal of that day. The kids in the preschool program have black hair, unlike all the other kids who have orange hair from malnutrition. And they put a big bowl a uh, big metal bowl of, you know, rice with some lentils, a little bit of protein of some kind in it, some peanuts or some lentils. And the children, all of whom are hungry, and these are little kids, they just quietly share. They don't grab. They wait their turn. They make room for each other. I thought, that doesn't even look like my family dinner table. It was so um, very beautiful to see, to see the how generosity lives in a situation where you would think it would be the complete opposite. And seeing things like that gives me hope for us humans at a time in our world and our country that some people are not feeling so much hope. Lots of hope for the goodness and beauty 
and resilience and generosity and love. That is who we most truly are. So that's my answer, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, Trudy. Beautiful. It is difficult, though, when we have this kind of stress that's going on. It is difficult to make that move to get out of our own bubble of anxiety. And we do tend to believe the stories we tell ourselves. We do tend to believe our thoughts and so on. So, yeah, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that's one of the great gifts of learning mindfulness or loving awareness is you can actually step back and say, wow, look at that story. I wasn't really there, was I? Or I made up, Mark Twain put it this way, he said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened, right? And you can see how the media now wants you to be afraid. They want to grab the kind of primitive brainstem and say... You know, you should be afraid, be afraid of the Muslims, be afraid of the immigrants, be afraid of the Mexicans, be afraid of the transgender, be afraid of, you know, black, brown, yellow, whatever it is. You should be afraid, you should be really afraid. Don't fall for it. It's not who we are. But we get so busy in our life um, that we don't notice somehow that that captures us. Albert Einstein said at one point, if you can drive safely while kissing a girl, you're simply not giving the kiss the attention it deserves, right? <laughs> so there's something about our human capacity, even in this multitasking world, to take a breath and a pause and stop and remember, what am I, or don't know, or, or to remember love in some fundamental, deep way. And the beautiful thing, what you're asking about Raghu and Trudy's talking about, and Duncan, is not that you have to become something else. Um, and yes, there are the stories in the self. Really what you do is, what you have to remember is who you are, remember love. So a few things to say about this. Um, Alice Walker writes at one point of a character, she writes, one day I was sitting there like a motherless child, which I was, and it come to me that feeling of being a part of everything, and I knew if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laugh, and I cry, and I run all around the house, because when it happens, you can't miss it. Now, the reality is that you and I know this. We got born into this strange, mysterious human body. How did you get in there? Anybody know? You know? And there you have one, a hole at the end into which you stuff dead plants and animals, right? And glug them down through the tube and you move by falling one direction and catch yourself and move the other. These wiggly things at the end and stuff. That's, it's bizarre. And if you don't think it's weird, pay attention the next time you're making love. It's a fabulous thing to do, but it's strange. Really it is, you know? And then a little, sometimes a little squirt, a little egg, oh, new person. Come on, how does this happen? So here we are. But the thing is that that separate sense of self, which you need as a child to kind of function in the world and so forth, um, is, only, is only partly true. There is something you have to tend, as Ramdas says, you need to remember your Buddha nature and your social security number. So you need both sides of the equation. But you know this from walking in the high mountains, from listening to an amazing piece of music, from making love, from taking sacred medicine, from sitting at the bedside of someone who's dying, as you did, Duncan, or sitting or being with someone when a child is born or giving birth to your own child, and the gates to the mystery open, and you realize, oh, I'm part of some amazing dance of life that's not just this body, but consciousness itself unfolding in these forms. You, spirit was born into the, your body, and it will leave in the end. And with the trainings of the heart of meditation, you get to step back and go, oh yeah, here's the drama I'm caught in, here's the fears and the stories that the media is telling, or my family, or the culture. That's not who we are. Who we are is love. Everybody's looking for it. You know, I wish it would go up the chain of command so they felt they got it. 
but it's really what we are made of, love and consciousness. And then you begin to operate in a different way because you remember that this is what matters. It's what matters in the end. A friend of ours, teacher, colleague Wes Nisker, went to interview Gary Snyder, great environmentalist, Pulitzer Prize winner, um, 50 years writing about bioregionalism. Gary, the oceans are rising, the climate is, uh, temperature is climbing, the species are dying out. What advice do you have? And Gary said, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. If you're going to save it, don't save it out of guilt. Don't save it out of anger. Don't save it out of fear. Save it because you love it. Save it because it's your family. It's your people. Yes. It's your being. Yes, yes. And that the, the only power that's big enough, which is who we are, is the power of love. It's like mothers lifting cars off their babies. This is really, it's not fear, it's not guilt, shame, it's not all that stuff. It's the fact that it's us. And the thing that's beautiful that you're pointing to, Raghu, is that somewhere deep inside, and that all of you point to, we know this already. We know this as surely as we know our own name, and all the different spiritual practices are to come back to this great heart of love. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, you and I have talked about this over the last few days. We've been in Ojai uh, at a retreat, a Ram Dass retreat, actually, who's Skyped in there. He's going to be Skyped in here today. And we've talked about just, we've had a conversation exactly along the lines of what Jack just laid out around collectively we do the same thing that we do as an individual. We tell our collective story. There's the other side. Those people are all ignorant and they don't know what they're doing. And there's our side, which we are right. They are wrong. That's the polarization. Yeah, talk a little bit about what you were talking about, Duncan, in terms of what effect that has on us individually and collectively. Well, uh, you guys are amazing. Um, you're amazing. When I first met him, we did this podcast. You can listen to it. I don't know if I said it on the podcast. I was pissed. I still am, unfortunately. But I remember saying to him something along the lines of like, we, we have to do something. This was years ago. This was probably 2013. This is before I got cancer. This is before, this is 2013. I'm like, we got to do something. When do we start throwing Molotov cocktails or something like that? Like, I was really pissed. Like, I was looking at the world and seeing some kind of future where a police state could happen and this sense of like, we got to, there is no time for this hippie crap. We have to fight, you know? We don't want to be like Gandhi, who apparently wrote a letter to Hitler What's that? You don't want to be like us. That's yeah, funny. you'll turn into these peaceful people who are happy all the time. <laughs> but then there's also a sense of like, okay, yeah, great. We're all made of love. Send that in a postcard to Hitler. Hey, do you mind stopping what you're doing? Because you know everyone's made of love. And so I was kind of in that state of like, look, man, we can't, this is, this is a, not a... It was, I believed him, too. I mean, it was real. Now you say that to me. I know. We've had a little role reversal. But there was a sense of like anger and, 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 and uh, me being really upset. And that was when he began to explain to me, you know, if we are doing that, the thing you're doing, then it just goes on and on and on and on forever. Like, I don't know if you've seen this. There's an amazing cartoon. It shows some dictator being pushed over by a crowd of people. And there's like a windmill of dictators under the ground. And every time you push one over, another one comes up. And so this is a problem because what starts happening is you get angry and you're right. You're right. Usually a lot of the times you're right. You're angry and it's right. This is injustice that's happening. It's true. And so then in that state, there's a lot of room to rationalize uh, terrible forms of aggression and violence. And 
the next thing you know, you know, you become this very thing that you were so upset about. I get attacked on Twitter sometimes. I'm sure this has never happened to any of you, but I, some like super, super, super right-wing person started attacking me. And he was talking about this journalist and this thing that happened in Saudi, right? And, was, and, and he was like trying to justify what happened to the journalist. And it was just a perfect chance to be right about something. How easy to write to me, like, you know, I don't think it's ever a good time to dismember a journalist. I don't know of a good time for that. Easy to be right there. But I thought, so what? Then I just, then it's this endless, horrific game of ping pong. So I said, hey, you know, uh, not to change the subject, but what did you do today? <laughs> and he wrote back, oh, what? I'm working on a fantasy novel. <laughs> He wrote back, I wrote 10 pages of a fantasy novel today. And I said, wow, that, that takes a lot of discipline. How do you do that? How do you get the discipline to do that? And he's like, well, it's just a great day. To, it was just a great day today. I just had a really good day. And then he started talking about his dog. And then suddenly we were talking. This wasn't a person on any side of any political spectrum. It's a fantasy novel author who loves his dog. I think somewhere in there. That's where it's at. Mm. Yeah, you know? beautiful. Thank beautiful. You. And that's, Trudy, that's what you brought up, and you, Jack, that innate, in the deepest part of ourselves, we really want people to feel love. We want them, uh, mudita, right, which is the Buddhist sympathetic joy. We really do want that for people. And it gets covered up. And I think part of what we're talking about here is what do we do to uncover that? I think that that's a, you know, a relevant question. We meditate. Then we meditate some more until we are so sick of the story of me coming up over and over and my demons and my passions and my lust and my hates and my... And finally, when those demons, you know, you see they appear for like the 10,000th time, they just don't pack the same wallop. And the story of me, which is so fascinating, endlessly fascinating, I don't know about you, but it's fascinating until it isn't. And one of the great things about meditation is you get bored with it. Not the meditation. Oh, you get bored with that sometimes too. I won't lie, you do, but um, if you stay with it, you discover that this me, yeah, it's magnificent to be life in the form of me and life in the form of you. But all the things that we carry with us as I am not worthy or I'm more than worthy, I am so cool, I'm this, I'm that, that part kind of falls away it's not front and center, and what's front and center is the ability to connect with each other. Just like with Duncan, that story was so cool because we connect with each other around the simplest things, actually. Those are our life, those simple things that we all do every day. That was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I loved that. Yeah. 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 The thing is that you don't have to get rid of yourself or your ego. Um, you just have to see it for what it is. It's your personality. We all have a personality and they're all weird. Just face it, right? But it's not who we are. And you can say, the mind spins out in these stories and these ways. Thank you for trying to protect me. I'm okay for now. And then instead, if you struggle against things, they last longer your judgments and your fears. You say, oh, this is fear, this is judgment. The, the judging mind, thank you for your opinion. I'll be all right now. I appreciate you're trying to protect me. And you step into a place of loving awareness that says, this is the, the self-protective ways that we've learned to move through the world. And we're bigger than that. And we have dignity and integrity um, and a deep vision. And as you meditate, as Trudy you know, um, commending to you as you find your own practice. It's not so much a self-improvement game where you, you know, 
you go to the gym and you work out and you have a good diet and you have a coach and you know you go to therapy and you're trying to improve. Meditation isn't about self-improvement. Um, you're not trying to perfect yourself. You're trying to perfect your love. And that includes of your own life, both it's sort of limited and beautiful and messy, to hold it with love and realize that who you are is much bigger than the stories and personalities and that that is connected with all the things that you care about, which is the whole world. So I read you a poem from Mark Nepo, and it speaks about what it means to sit in meditation or to sit and quiet your mind and tend your heart so that then you can move through world and be effective. It's called a drift. He says, everything is beautiful and I am sad. This is how the heart makes a duet of wonder and grief. The light spraying through the lace of the fern is as delicate as the fibers of memory forming their web around the knot in my throat. The breeze makes the birds move from branch to branch as this ache makes me look for those I've lost in the next room, in the next song. In the very center, under it all, what we have that no one can take away and all that we've lost face each other. It is there that I'm adrift, feeling punctured by a holiness that exists inside everything. I am so sad and everything is beautiful. And it's really an invitation to the greatness of heart that can hold the 10,000 joys and sorrows of life um, that can tolerate your humanity and the humanity of others with love and hold in this way the whole of the world and then you're free to move through it and bring your blessings and bring the gifts that you have to offer and reach your hand out and mend and touch the places that you can mend. You can't do it all but you must do something for the sake of your heart and you, if you listen you'll know what what, what those things are. And I just want to say, you can't do it alone. We need each other. It's just too grim and lonesome to try and do it all by ourselves. Yeah. We have to have community. So, yeah. 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 And that wonderful thing, when they asked the Buddha of the three vows, which is the most important? Refuge in the Buddha, refuge in the Dharma, refuge in Sangha, as you were saying, and Sangha, community. That's it. So I want to say we have a community here in L.A. It's called Insight L.A. You can find us at insightla.org. And I hope you'll come sit with us. Good. Yes. So it looks like uh, Ram Das is ready to hang out with us a little bit. Can you hear us, Ram Das? Yes. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi Ramdas. Hi, Ramdas. Hi. We love you, Ramdas. Oh, you are you are, you are, you're all beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. So, our first uh, we we have a uh, a question or two. So I'm going to. I can't see very well, but question? Hi, I have to start by saying thank you to Duncan, to Ramdas, to Trudy, to Jack, and to your whole generation for bringing these traditions to us. Uh, Can you speak a little more slowly, please? Because it's louder oh, here, sure, here. Louder, too. Yeah, thank you. Just a word of loving gratitude to you and to your whole generation for laying the groundwork for our ability to join these communities and be part of these traditions. And with that, a question for Ramdas. In this time when there's so much fear and anxiety about the future, what do we do to stay in the moment? And what would you recommend for us, all of us, as a daily practice? Turn off your television. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I 
identify with spirit, identify with soul. Don't involve yourself with other people's karma. Other people act or opinions are their karma. If you identify with your soul, then you will see others as a soul. And you will feel compassion for that soul. And the, the culture is Mushugana. And you can't do anything about it. The way I can have an effect, I be and not do be. Be love. Be compassion. Be wisdom. Be peace. Be joy. You be it. Be it. And being radiates outward. Just walk down the street and love everybody. Be, be who you are. Who you are inside you are a light and will be radiating around you be love Be wisdom. Be joy. Be compassion. Be peace. Be it. Be it. Be it. And then once you have gone in, 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 and you have your being, each of us, each of us has that being. That being is the one. the Atman. And each of us has that being and we are one. We are one in that being. And that one will defeat the separation that we have now. 
the separation that leads to fear, that leads to war. <laughs> yes? Yes, yes. Another question over here? Well, I feel like you've answered this last question and so many more. So thank you, Ramdas, for that. Um, with the increasing explicit polarization in this country, um, what perspective could we employ for inclusivity? So with the increased polarization that is going on in this country, what might you, advice might you give about creating more inclusivity rather than polarization? Some of which you just answered in the part of that for, for the first question, right? But maybe at this point, because I know that you are constantly giving people a method to be able to, within, them, within their own self, unify their own selves through uh, loving awareness. So maybe you can give us that teaching, I think would be great. This is a mantra. I am loving awareness. 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 Loving awareness is a name for the soul. The soul loves everything and everyone. Yeah. Your monkey mind going all, all over the place. Up here is your ego. And then from here, go into the spiritual heart. Down like that. And there in the spiritual heart, you will Notice a doorway or a veil to the next consciousness plane. The next consciousness plane is soul land. 
uh, individual song coming from the one. Ramdas. Ramdas, sometimes you talk about how you move through the world and you talk about us practicing I am loving awareness. How is it for you when you move through the world? Sometimes you talk about how you meet the world with love or whatever. Would you say something about that? I love everything or every being. My guru said to me, Ram Dass, love everybody and tell the truth. That has been my North Star for my sadhana, for my path, my spiritual path. And I identified with my soul and there I was loving everybody and telling the truth. I see everyone as souls or as spiritual beings and I love them and I as I live in the world things will happen inside of me greed fear, self-reference. And those, those dark forces in my brain, my mind, I used to say to them, I love you to death. But I don't say that anymore because that's too violent for my soul. I say, I love you. I love you, you greed. I love you, fear. I just love everything. I love my aches and pains. <laughs> and I love my ego. Ha. We love the soul land that you've created, not just today in this theater with so many people. But in the last, we, this has been going on everybody for the last three days. Ramdas has been sharing with different groups soul land. So we love this soul land that you create wherever you are. So thank you so much, Ramdas. So we're out of time here. I want to thank Jack and Trudy and Duncan on behalf of Love Server Member Foundation and of course Ram Das and we thank the summit for having us and we thank you for all being here and uh, Namaste. Namaste. Thank you.